Welcome to Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now you can learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property. Learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau with the Mineola Law Firm of Shane Dox, Denise, and Corker. He's a member of the Committee on Professional Ethics of the Bar Association of Nassau County and counsel to the Nassau Academy of Law. And now, here is your host for Law You Should Know, attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Today we have a special program on Brexit and the law, and we'll learn all about, all, a little more about Brexit and its legal consequences. And to discuss that is Ian Anderson, and we'll have a little bio for him in a moment. And also assisting me today is Brandon Kaufman, a student here at Nassau Community College, and it's newscaster for WHPC. Ian, welcome to Law You Should Know, and Brandon, thanks for your help with Law You Should Know. Thank you for having me here. Okay, so Ian Anderson is a legal practitioner on three continents, including the U.S., Scotland, and South Africa, in civil, criminal, and human rights cases, as well as toxic torts, including chemical and radiation. So what is Brexit? Oh, the term Brexit, it has basically two meanings. Uh, The first meaning reflects the UK's um, notification to the European Commission under Article 50 of the Treaty of Lisbon that it intends to withdraw as a member state of the European Union. Brexit is also used in a secondary sense, referring to the negotiations between the UK and the EU with regard to what UK status will be after it leaves the European Union. For example, is basically negotiating as a non-EU member for whatever agreements it can make with the EU, after which will come into force after it leaves. Okay, so what is the EU? What is the EU? <laughs> Good question. Well, basically, it's a 28-state supranational political, economic, and monetary union. It has uh, 310 million EU citizens with EU citizenship, including you, basically myself. <laughs> um, it um, also has a, uh, an executive council, which um, it basically has a, a president and functions like um, a US administration with a president. It has an administration called the EU Commission, uh, which uh, functions as uh, the major civil service. It has 28 commissioners and 32,000 civil servants uh, running the commission. It has a parliament uh, of over 600 members, which are elected by publicly funded elections from all of the member states. Uh, It has a court of justice. Uh, to deal with questions under EU law. It, it has both um, an appellate and first instance level. That's in Luxembourg. It has a central bank. It has a, an investment bank. It also has EU diplomatic missions in various countries all over the world. And it's now moving towards a EU defence force. Whether that will come into fruition, I don't know, but that's uh, the current movement. Um, and I must say that also, um, since it has a a central bank and the EU as its major currency the EU represents one of the largest reserve currencies after the US dollar in the world today and it represents the internal market of the EU as the richest internal market in the world. Before you tell us a little more about Brexit, is it almost like a state in the United States wants to leave the United States of America? In some ways you're quite right it is like that because at the moment um, in America there's free movement of people and and goods and products amongst the states. Um, And basically, Britain is saying, well, we don't want any more of that. We're going to move out and be on our own. Now, in the United States, it probably cannot happen uh, without a war. But in Europe, it's part of the agreement that they can opt out. That is correct. But my point is that the Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty 2005 was the first time that um, a mechanism for a state to withdrawal was actually set out in legislation. Before then, it was implied a state could withdraw, but there was never actually any mechanism for, for the withdrawal process. And was Britain part of that treaty before 2005? 
Uh, yes, it was part of the 2005 treaty, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. okay we're going to go back to Brandon. Uh, what is the EU's lawmaking process? The lawmaking process is uh, is quite interesting. The EU Commission, which is the civil service, um, can propose legislation. And also the Parliament or the, or the Council, the executive body, can ask the EU Commission to research and propose legislation. The legislation being proposed is sent to the EU Parliament, and they have their committee meetings on it, and they make recommendations. The recommendations are sent back to the executive body, the Council, and they make further recommendations. If both approve, then the EU Parliament will pass the uh, legislation as law. So it sounds like they have a little bit of checks and balances, but I imagine it's operated differently under the EU. It's a little bit like um, uh, uh, Washington, uh, the, the, um, the House of Representatives and the Senate, because if there's a clash between the Council and the Parliament over the proposed legislation, they can set up a reconciliatory committee in which the, the language, problematic language in the bill is uh, resolved, and then the bill can be passed. A bit like uh, legislation here in that sense, anyway. And once the EU passes some kind of law... It's binding on all the all the member countries. Yes, but you've got to remember there's two different types of law here. There's what they call regulations. Once the regulation is passed, it automatically becomes part of the domestic law of the European countries. But there's another form of legislation they pass, which is called directives. And a directive um, seeks to obtain a particular goal. So a directive might say to the member states, look, we want you to, for example, do this particular thing with achieve this particular goal with regard to worker safety. But they don't spell out the legislation. They leave that to the state itself to present the legislation domestically. And has that happened with the immigrants, immigrations migrating to Europe that some countries don't want to let them in so easily or let them stay? And others do? Well, yeah, th- that's quite interesting because um, they have a, a co-competence with regard to immigration, co-competence between the EU and the member states itself. The member states itself themselves have different regulations for immigration, and they can basically do what they want with regard to imposing regulations on non-EU citizens coming into their territory. The EU itself um, has a a kind of general uh, regulations regarding immigration. Uh, For example, all member states must allow immigrants to come in for the purposes of study, uh, for the purposes of um, work, uh, provided it's, uh, for example, seasonal work. Um, And that's all all EU citizens. All non-EU EU citizens. Non- uh-huh. EU citizens. So they allow them into state for for issues like uh, like work and study if it's on a temporary basis. But also there's a regular there's a rule which says that if uh, uh, a non-EU citizen becomes an EU citizen in any of the member states, the member states must allow his EU family non-EU family to join him. And what about political asylum? Political asylum is um, Did something have to follow which, the same standard. Uh, well, it's something which is left to the individual states. Um, Germany has been fairly liberal with regard to political asylum from this massive influx of um, refugees from the Middle East, which is probably the worst since the Second World War. Um, there is a, a sort of problem here with immigration because Germany is a good example of this, as is Britain. The population in Germany and Britain are, are aging at a rapid amount, which means that um, they have to co- they will consume a lot of social security benefits for an aging population. On the other hand, the young worker, worker pump population is decreasing. So both of, the, both of these countries require an influx of young immigrants to maintain their economic uh, tax um, uh, levels. Whether it was right or wrong, was that one of the issues behind Brexit to stem the flow of immigrants? Basically, yes. That was a, and that was a dilemma in Britain because Britain basically needs young immigrants. But there was a, um, a feeling in Britain that this would change the culture. This is really an emotional thing. It was done by referendum. wasn't done by Parliament. And, of course, Scotland voted against uh, leaving the EU, as did I, Northern Ireland. And, uh, and London itself voted against it. It was only Middle England um, which said, no, we want to remain now, different. Right now, assuming Scotland is not declaring independence from uh, Britain, 
Do they rise and fall with Britain? If Britain does leave the EU, so does Scotland and Northern Ireland automatically? Automatically, that is correct, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the EU state admission requirements? Oh, state admission? Well, basically, there are three admissions, uh, st uh, state admission requirements. First, you have to have a functioning democracy. Uh, second, you have to adhere to a human rights code. And third, you have to have a functioning uh, market economy. As, uh, as defined by European law? Well, as defined generally by the by principles of European law, especially the adherence to human rights. In that regard, any country which wishes to join the European Union has to sign up to what's called the European Convention on Human Rights. This is a, a convention which is not actually part of the EU itself. It was set up um, in the late 40s to promote uh, human rights in Europe. And it established uh, a court uh, at which, through which um, citizens of the individual states which signed it could sue their own particular countries for violations of the convention. Um, it's not part of the EU. It, the EU is somewhat different, but the EU insists that any member state who wants, any state which wishes to join, must uh, sign up on the European Convention of Human Rights. So they just meet those certain standards to be admitted as part of the EU. EU. What effect will Brexit have on UK law? Oh, that is a very good question. You have to uh, distinguish two issues here. Once the uh, UK withdraws from the European Union, which might be 2019, all of the, the massive uh, treaties, about half a dozen major treaties, will cease to uh, be applicable to the UK. So it won't have access to the court or the parliament or anything else. However, over the last 45 years, Britain joined in 1973, what was then the EEC. So over the last 45 years, there's been masses and masses of legislation coming from uh, the European Parliament, uh, with consent of the Council. And these have been incorporated into UK domestic law. So the dilemma was, well, what happens to the, all these regulations which are now in, for the last 45 years been in UK domestic law? What the UK Parliament has done, it has presented a European Withdrawal 2018 Act, which will probably, sign, probably be signed in the next couple of months. And that Act preserves all of the EU regulations currently in force in Britain for the last 45 years, but not the EU directives. And I mentioned earlier the, the difference between them. Otherwise, if they didn't do that, there'd be total chaos in, in, the, European, in the UK legal system. Now, this withdrawal agreement, this is an internal document for Britain, or this is an agreement with the EU, EU like a, a discharge plan? Well, it's an agreement with the EU. It's, not, it's, it's sort of like a discharge plan insofar as the amount of money the UK owes the EU, which could be between 35 and 60 billion uh, euros. But insofar as... Can they as just re refuse to pay or they'll, they won't be let out if they don't pay? Oh, well, they'll be let out. Whether it's like a toll they have to pay uh -huh, on got, the way out. Anyway, but on uh, what condition? You, you see, the real object of the, these, these negotiations are... What will Britain have any, will the UK have any further agreements as a third party with the EU? For example, will so they, it they want to preserve some of the good they want in to preserve terms of the trade the and, and some other That's things. Correct, yeah. We're going to come back to that in a moment. We're taking a short break now. You're listening to WHBC 90.3, the voice of NASA Community College, and also over the internet at ncc.edu slash WHBC. We'll be back in a moment. This portion of programming on WHPC is brought to you on behalf of the Nassau County Bar Association, helping both the public and lawyers since 1899. They are the largest suburban bar association in the country. The Nassau County Bar Association offers clinics where you can meet privately with an attorney to prevent or solve legal problems involving Hurricane Sandy, foreclosure, wills, or elder law. Speakers on almost any legal topic are also available to schools or community groups. They can also help lawyers advance their legal careers and offer a place to Network. Learn more about the Nassau County Bar Association by calling 516-747-4070 or visit NassauBar.org. Once again, we continue with Law You Should Know. 
from the Mineola Law Firm of Shane, Docks, Denise, Corker, and Sauer. Here is attorney Kenneth J. Le-